following lecture is aimed for dental students, interns, junior trainees, junior residents of oral surgery and oral maxillofacial surgery, as well as junior residents of other dental specialities. I also dedicate this lecture to my fellow colleagues and dental practitioners of several dental specialties all over the world. May you all benefit from it. In memory of my late parents, may Almighty Merciful God rest their souls in heaven and peace. Please allow me to give a brief bio about the speaker. My name is Mohammed El Shulkami. I'm a professor of oral and maxillofacial surgery at the Faculty of Dentistry, Suez Canal University in Ismailia, Egypt. This lovely city, which lies around 120 kilometers to the eastern of the capital Cairo in Egypt, it was named after the late uh, great ruler of Egypt, Khedivi Ismail, the one who did the opening ceremonies of the Suez Canal in 1869. I'm also the professor and the supervisor of the oral maxillofacial surgery department at Faculty of Dentistry, Sinai University, Kantara campus in Ismailia. I also worked as a part-time associate professor at MIU University and MSA University for several years. I'm a visiting professor at the Faculty of Dentistry, Beirut Arab University in the oral and maxillofacial surgery department in Beirut, Lebanon. I'm also the managing director of the Egyptian Dental Center, a multi-speciality discipline dental and maxillofacial center based in Cairo, Egypt. The main topic for today, I find it one of the most important topics in the dental practice, is the management of the medically compromised patients. And the topic of our lecture today is the management of hematological disorders in the dental practice. What disorders do we have? We have two main categories. First of all, hereditary coagulopathies, and the second is the therapeutic anticoagulation. Let's start with the hereditary coagulopathies. We are going to discuss types and prevalence, potential risks, and last but not the least, the management protocol. We have two main categories, coagulation factors deficiency and platelet problems. Let's start with the coagulation factors deficiency. We have two main types, hemophilia and von Willebrand disease. Actually, there are three types of hemophilia, hemophilia A and hemophilia B and hemophilia C. Hemophilia A is the most common type. It approximately occurs in 85% of the hemophiliacs. And it occurs due to the lack of blood clotting factor number 8, which is called the anti-hemophilic globulin factor. On the other hand, hemophilia B is the second most common type, and it is also known as factor 9 deficiency or Christmas disease. Hemophilia C it occurs due to lack of clotting factor number 11. So, what about prevalence and frequency? Let's start with hemophilia A. Actually, one in every 4,000 to one in every 5,000 males are born with this disorder worldwide. So, it is the most common type of hemophilia as previously mentioned. On the other hand, one in every 20,000 newborn males worldwide might suffer from hemophilia B. Hemophilia B was first reported in the literature in 1952 in a patient with the name of Stephen Christmas. Whereas hemophilia C is a rare genetic disorder, it's caused by the missing or defective blood clot factor, which is factor number 11, and it was first reported in the literature in 1953 in patients who experienced severe bleeding after dental extractions. Both hemophilia A and hemophilia B are inherited diseases. They are inherited as an X-linked recessive pattern. The genes associated with such conditions are located on the X chromosome, which is one of the two sex chromosomes. And in males who have only one X chromosome, any altered copy of the gene in each cell is sufficient to cause the condition. And hence, 
The two major forms of hemophilia occur much more commonly in males, or that's to say the females are the carriers and the males are the ones who suffer. For example, if a father doesn't have hemophilia, marries a mother who is a carrier of the hemophilia gene, one of the X genes, there is a 50% chance that the sons will have hemophilia. One of the sons is going to have hemophilia, or 50% of the sons is going to have hemophilia. On the other hand, 50% chance of the daughters will be a carrier of the hemophilia gene. Let's come to formerly brand disease. The formerly brand factor is a plasma protein, a multimeric plasma protein, which is produced by the endothelial cells. It plays an important role in the cascade of clotting and coagulation. It promotes uh, platelet adhesion to the subendothelium as well as platelet aggregation. And moreover, it is a carrier protein of factor number eight. So let's have a quick review on the clotting factors. We have factor number one, fibrinogen, factor two, prothrombin, factor three, tissue thromboplastin, factor number four, calcium ions, factor number five, the labile factor or the pro uh, accelerin. factor six is not assigned a name, factor number seven, stable factor or proconvertin, and factor eight, the, the famous and the notorious one, the antihemophilic globulin factor. And we have factor number nine, Christmas factor, or the plasma thromboplastin component. Factor number 10, Stuart Brower factor. And factor 11, plasma thromboplastin antecedent. Factor 12, it's called Hegman factor or Hegman factor. Factor 13 is the fibrin stabilizing factor. And here are the two common pathways for blood clotting, the intrinsic pathway or the, and the extrinsic pathway. And we can notice that the prothrombin time is used to test the extrinsic pathway and the partial thromboplastin time or the PTT or activated partial thromboplastin time is used to monitor the intrinsic system. <laughs> and it is clear from this figure that in a healthy patient when a normal blood vessel gets injured, platelet adhesion and aggregation will form which is followed by the cascade and the activation of either extrinsic or intrinsic pathways and formation of a blood clot. Whereas in hemophiliac patient, there is failure to form such blood clot and persistent bleeding will follow. In most cases, the patients with hereditary coagulopathies know their problem and know they have a, a bleeding problem and they are going to tell you that we have such a bleeding problem. However, if you are cautious and you are alert, and you, you feel suspicious about this case, you can, you, you, you can tell or, or, or know how this patient will be a risk for bleeding from some points in the history you can ask for, such as, if the patient have previous excessive bleeding from an injury or after surgery or dental work, if they suffer from epistaxis, which is nasal bleeding that do not stop within 10 minutes, if a female patient have heavy or long menstrual bleeding, if the patient suffers from hematuria or blood in the stools, if they suffer from easy bruising or lump bruises or spontaneous bleeding. All such potential risks might lead to persistent post-operative bleeding on the dental uh, chair, and you have to ask before going to any elective surgery about the uh, full clotting profile to be on the safe side. Now let's shift for platelet problems. Platelet problems might be quantitative, like thrombocytopenia, or qualitative, like thrombosthenia. Platelet inadequacy in general causes easily bruising in the patient, and they are evaluated by bleeding time and platelet count. Quantitative deficiency may be cyclic problem, so it's the hematologist or the primary care physician might decide when to go for elective dental surgery. And usually patients with chronically low counts can be given platelet transfusion. Actually, it needs a platelet count below 50,000 per cubic millimeter before any serious abnormal post-operative bleeding occurs. And sometimes the hematologist may wish to withhold platelet transfusion if the count is between 20,000 50, to 50,000 per cubic millimeter until post-operative bleeding becomes a problem. On the other hand, in some cases where we have counts more than 50,000 per cubic millimeter, platelet transfusion may be given because we have a qualitative platelet problem. 
obviously any plate that counts below 20,000 per cubic millimeter will need platelet transfusion and the surgery is delayed until the count is adjusted. On the other hand, in 1918, a Swiss pediatrician named Glanzmann initially described the term called thrombasthenia. He noted perpric bleeding in patients with normal platelet counts, and the term thrombasthenia refers to weak platelets. That's to say, the platelets are normal in count, but they are weak in their function. Actually, Glanzmann thrombasthenia is one of several inherited disorders of platelet dysfunction which also includes bernard solier syndrome as well as other deficiencies of platelet adhesion and platelet aggregation and secretion. And such disorders are characterized by a lifelong bleeding tendency. So, first of all, which comes on the top of the pyramid of management is the baseline clotting profile or coagulation profile assessment and consultation of the physician, the primary care physician or the hematologist. The baseline clotting profile includes prothrombin time, PT and INR, partial thromboplastin time, the PTT, platelets count, and bleeding time. Actually, the INR was introduced to eliminate any variations in the different laboratories and different hospitals and different reagents and kits used for prothrombin time evaluation. And the INR, which is the stands for the International Normalized Ratio, it is the ratio between the patient's PT and the standard control PT of the test used. And let's have a brief interpretation of the coagulation profile tests. The reference range for prothrombin time is 11 to 12.5 seconds, while the reference range for the INR is 0.8 to 1.1, in healthy people, an INR of 1.1 or below is considered normal, whereas an INR range of 2 to 3 is considered an effective therapeutic range for people taking warfarin as an anticoagulant. The normal bleeding time is between 2 to 7 minutes, while the normal platelet count lies between 150,000 to 450,000 per cubic millimeter, and last but not the least, normal PTT or partial thromboplastin time is between 25 to 35 seconds. And following the management protocol, any surgery should be deferred until hematological consultation is done and the baseline hematological tests are performed. In severe cases, we should consider hospitalization to have good control for the case. Usually, patients who receive factor replacement can contract HIV or hepatitis viruses and therefore appropriate precautions must be taken in consideration during management of such patients. Schedule the appointment soon after any coagulation correction measures. So, let's see what our options for coagulation correction measures. We have factor replacement, and this the hematologist suggests according to each case. We can have fresh frozen plasma, plated transfusion, and the use of uh, antifibrinolytic agents uh, such as aminocaproic acid or amicar and tranexamic acid. Most operatively monitor the wound for two hours and give clear instructions to the patient to avoid dislodgement of the blood clot, to avoid hot food and beverage, and to avoid vigorous mouth rinsing, and also the instructions should include what to do if the bleeding restarts. And regarding the local anesthetic techniques, all nerve block techniques should be avoided, some authors prefer that you can use local infiltration and others recommend only periodontal ligament injection. I would be a cautious one and I would recommend only the periodontal ligament injections using the Ligmaject. Some patients might need sedation to avoid talking and prevent them from talking after the operation, especially when they are hospitalized because any talking or uh, any manipulation increases the salivation and uh, unfortunately the saliva contains fibrinolytic system and uh, which can cause fibrinolysis of the blood clot especially after surgical manipulation and last but not the least there are local clot augmentation methods that we should stick to to prevent any bleeding from occurrence clot promotion methods we should use uh, what we call gelatin sponge 
uh, it, it can be impregnated or saturated with thrombin or not. It is uh, called gel foam. It comes in, a, in, in a sh tubes. You can use them and put them inside the socket. It an actually acts as a scaffold which attracts the blood cells and the, uh, allows platelet aggregation and adhesion to start the cascade of the blood clotting. We can also use uh, surgery seal or the oxidized regenerated cellulose. Collagen uh, is, has now become available in a microfibular pattern or a collagen plug, cola plug, or a collagen tape, cola tape. And all of these materials can be impregnated or saturated with thrombin. This is the collagen plug on the left hand side, and it is inserted in the right hand figure inside the socket. And here it is in place in the socket, and on the right hand side it is secured with figure of eight sutures. Anti hemorrhagic stents are also used. You can take an impression preoperatively and prepare a stent over the wound to prevent bleeding and uh, uh, keep the pressure pack in place. And you can also uh, line this uh, anti hemorrhagic stent with an. Uh, uh, a blood clotting promotion uh, substance or antifibrinolytic material such as tranexamic acid. Sutures, a figure of eight sutures, you look at this figure, it goes uh, like a pattern from uh, entry number one to uh, number two, then to uh, entry in the number three and then number four and again coming back to tie it with number one. It's like you are drawing a figure of eight. It is indicated in the extraction socket closure to, to avoid bleeding and adaptation of the gingival papilla around the teeth. And if you have a bone graft and if you, or if you are placing uh, an augmentation uh, material like the oxidized cellulose or like the gel foam or like the collagen plug. Last but not the least, well-placed ghost pressure packs and let the patient buy it on for at least one hour after the operation over the uh, cola plug or the uh, figure of eight sutures. And here we come to the therapeutic anticoagulation. We are going to discuss the indications and types of anticoagulants, then a brief review of the literature and consultation and decision making, and last but not the least, the management protocol. When are anticoagulants indicated? In patients with thrombogenic implanted devices, such as prosthetic cardiac valves, and in patients with thrombogenic cardiovascular problems, such as patients having atrial fibrillation, or uh, uh, patients with myocardial infarction, or patient who had cerebrovascular accident. And uh, last but not the least, the need for extracorporeal blood flow, uh, such as patients having renal hemodialysis. The main three types and categories of uh, anticoagulants are the aspirin and antiplatelet drugs, and warfarin and comedine, which is an uh, anti-vitamin K, and uh, heparin, which is antithrombin. <laughs> and when dealing with therapeutic anticoagulation, we have main two concerns. Do we stop the drug during the perioperative period and do some modifications in the treatment? In doing this, the patient might have what we call rebound thrombosis or might develop a thromboembolic event which is of course undesirable to the operator. On the other hand, we can proceed normal procedures and without stopping the drug and using clot promotion measures, only the local clot promotion, promotion measures previously mentioned. Let's have a quick review on the literature regarding this problem. In a paper published in 2015 under the title Management of Dental Extractions in Patients Taking Warfarin as Anticoagulant Treatment, a Systematic Review. <laughs> it has been concluded that patients with an INR within the therapeutic range can safely continue taking the drug uh, before dental extractions. 
and there is no evidence to support or reject the superiority of local hemostatic agents over warfarin discontinuation. Another article titled Anticoagulation Use Prior to Common Dental Procedures, a systematic review also it was published in 2019 in the Cardiology Research and Practice. It has been concluded that it was found that continuing anticoagulation during dental procedure did not increase the risk of bleeding in most trials. On the other hand, hyperembridging or hyperenconversion was associated with an increased bleeding incidence. And the authors recommended maintaining oral anticoagulant with vitamin K antagonist and novel oral anticoagulants for the vast majority of dental procedures along with the use of local hemostatic agents. Again, they stress on the local hemostatic agents. A nice article with the title Risk of Postoperative Bleeding After Dental Procedures in Patients on Warfarin, a retrospective study was published in 2012 in Oral Surgery, Oral Medicine, Oral Pathology, and Oral Radiology. The conclusions were there is a low incidence of persistent bleeding after invasive dental procedures, that's to say uncomplicated dental extractions or minor flapping in warfarinized patients, but the risk appears to increase with the use of concomitant antithrombotic medications with warfarin. Last but not the least, on the website of American Dental Association, a clinical practice statement from the American Academy of Oral Medicine based on literature review determined that moderately invasive oral surgery, which is defined as uncomplicated tooth extraction, is safe with an INR of 3.5, and some authors and experts stating that it is safe up to 4 INR. And here comes the decision-making moment. We are facing three options. Should you continue the anticoagulant drug during the perioperative period? Or should you stop the drug during the perioperative period? Or should we go for what we call the heparin shift or heparin conversion? I would recommend, according to the literature previously mentioned, that we should continue the drug during the perioperative period as long as we have the INR within the therapeutic range. And if this is not the case, we can resort to stopping the drug after, of course, performing baseline clotting profile and consulting the primary care physician and the hematologist, or we can uh, go to the heparin conversion if indicated. Let's see what we can do. In case we decide to stop the drug during the perioperative period, we have to answer three important questions. If the drug is allowed to be stopped by the physician, when to stop such drug? And in order to do this, we have to know how does each drug work, to know the rationale for stopping the drug or when to stop the drug, and last but not the least, when to restart the drug again post-operatively. Let's start with the aspirin taking patients or the antiplatelet drugs. We should consult the physician about the safety of stopping the anticoagulant for several days. And actually the aspirin is one of the drugs that you don't need to stop. You go and proceed your, 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 your surgery and you do the local uh, hemostatic measures and you follow. But if in such cases, if it is recommended to stop the drug, we have to follow the following protocol. The surgery is deferred until the drug has been stopped for five days and the local measures are taken as usual. So, last but not the least, when to restart the drug therapy after the operation? The drug should be started the day after surgery. And here is a brief diagram to show how the NSAIDs and the aspirin works in the inflammatory cascade. Actually, when we have a disturbance in the cell membrane, the phospholipids are released and uh, a phospholipase enzyme acts upon them to form the arachidonic acid and the corticosteroids prevent such uh, operation or such uh, catalysis or, or such uh, 
reaction to happen. So the arachidonic acid is not formed actually when we use corticosteroid as an anti-inflammatory. But the NS aids work on the cyclo cyclooxygenase enzyme or the COX-1 enzyme and COX-2. We have a COX-2 inhibitors and COX-1 inhibitors. The uh, cyclooxygenase pathway, which works on the arachidonic acid, it leads to formation of the prostaglandins and the thromboxane A2. The thromboxane A2 is one of the essential material to promote platelet aggregation and platelet adhesion, which is the uh, first step in the cascade of the coagulation. So NS is an antiplatelet drugs uh, violate the cyclooxygenase pathway and prevent the platelets from being uh, from being uh, able to aggregate and adhere and start the cascade of the blood clotting. So when we need to uh, stop the aspirin, and as we know that the lifespan of the blood platelets is about five to seven days, so we need to stop the drug for at least five days to have fresh new platelets having the cyclooxygenase uh, function and cyclooxygenase enzyme functioning properly to be able to perform clotting. Now let's go to the patients receiving comadine or warfarin. The physician should be consulted to determine the safety of allowing the PT to fall to 2 and 3.5 INR. We need the INR to be between 2 to 3.5 for a few days. And so we should consult the physician about the safety for doing that. First of all, the warfarin works by inhibiting the vitamin K dependent coagulation factors. These are the factor two, factor seven, and if you uh, add two to seven, it, it is nine, and then 10. So they are two, seven, nine, and 10. These factors need to be carboxylated in order to bind the calcium, which is intimately involved in the clotting cascade. The thing that performs carboxylation of such factors is vitamin K, and it goes from a reduced state to an oxidized state during carboxylation. So it needs to be recycled back to the reduced state, and this is done by an enzyme called vitamin K epoxide reductase. When the patient is giving warfarin or comadine, the comadine inhibits this enzyme, so the vitamin K cannot carboxylate the coagulation factors, which then are unable to bind calcium, and they are rendered ineffective, and the clotting cascade fails. So we obtain the baseline PT and INR, and if the PT is, gives a 2 to 3.5 on NR, we should proceed with the surgery, taking the local hemostatic measures previously mentioned. But if the INR is above 3.5 and above the therapeutic range, we should, should stop the warfarin or comadine two days before surgery because it needs two days to, to form uh, an efficient enzyme to, to, to in, in enhance the cascade of clotting. And we check the PT and NR daily, daily until uh, it falls within below 3.5 and we proceed when the INR falls below 3.5. When to restart the warfarin, it is restarted on the day of the surgery. We restart warfarin therapy on the day of the surgery after finishing the job. But what if the physician feels it is unsafe to allow PT to fall? The patients then must resort or we, we should resort to what we call the heparin shift from comadine or heparin conversion. And so the patient must be hospitalized for conversion from warfarin to heparin anticoagulation during the perioperative period. Because the heparin, a little bit, uh, there is some sort of, 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 of uh, uh, flexibility in dealing with heparin anticoagulation. So let's see what happens if we are dealing with heparin. The physician should be consulted to determine the safety of stopping heparin for the perioperative period. Let's first know how heparin works. It binds to an, uh, an enzyme called the antithrombin, a natural anticoagulant which acts on a bunch of different factors on both sides of the cascade, but usually it is more effective on the intrinsic arm than it does on the extrinsic arm of the coagulation. So heparin binds to antithrombin 3 and causes a conformational change that activates the enzyme and potentiates its action. And here is once more 
both arms of the cascade, the intrinsic and the extrinsic. And as we said before, the, the partial thromboplastin time used to test the intrinsic system and to monitor the heparin therapy. And on the other hand, the extrinsic system is tested by the PTO, the prothrombin time, to monitor the warfarin therapy. So going back to heparin, heparin is uh, stopped according to the uh, route of administration. We can defer the surgery until at least six hours if the heparin is given uh, intravenously or 24 hours if it is given subcutaneously. So we need six hours or 24 hours to pass after the heparin is stopped. Or in case of emergency, and, and as, as we said before, we have done the heparin shift and we have hospitalized the patient, we can reverse the heparin with its antidote, protamine sulfate. So, and we can do the operation, and uh, after we, we finish, we can restart heparin immediately once a good clot has formed. So, in such a case, when we do the heparin shift, the physician feels it is unsafe to stop the anticoagulants for the patient, the patient might develop a thromboembolic event, which is a serious problem we don't like to face. And remember always, the bottom line is to maintain the anticoagulant effect while performing our oral surgery with local surgical hemostatic measures. This is our main goal. We should always keep in mind that we should stick to keeping the drug going on to avoid any serious unfortunate thromboembolic events. Aristotle once said, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. Finally, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much.